This is Lefty Dad 8. Today I'm going to be doing a how to beginners tutorial for the SGS computer war game Africa Core. This Africa Core does not really resemble the original Avalon Hill game Africa Core from many decades ago. It has a much greater similarity to the Aegeod games, and of course that's because the creator of the SGS games is the same creator who did the Aegeod games. When I first started playing SGS Africa Core, for several hours I was frustrated because everything happened so quickly, and I really didn't have a clear idea of why these things were happening. So the purpose of this tutorial will be to slow things down and to explain all the details of the mechanics of the first part, the first turn of the game. So I'm going to start with Operation E, which took place in 1940. It's after the Italians had pushed the Commonwealth almost to Alexandria in Egypt, and this, to, this scenario has eight turns, and it really consists of the Commonwealth pushing the Italians back towards Libya and Tripoli. For that reason, the Italians will be run by the AI and I will be controlling the Allies. I've heard a lot of complaints about the AI regarding this game, and sometimes I hear complaints about any kind of AI in war games, but I have to say that I think the AI in this game is fine. Now, maybe after I've become an absolute expert at this game, which in no way am I an expert, I'll have a different opinion of the artificial intelligence, but playing against the AI is just fine for me, especially as I'm learning the game. And it may seem in the first turn that I'm winning, but that's because the Commonwealth did win in this uh, endeavor. So I'll load the scenario. It's a very beautiful game. And Everything you see now is being run by the AI, so it's happening fast. There is a card that it drew. The game does use a lot of drawing of cards, which is very interesting because the cards are beautiful and they create a great amount of replay replayability. And there's a lot of interesting information on these cards, but everything that's going on right now is the AI Italians, the Access Powers, attacking the Commonwealth right at the, it was the middle of the screen, and that's really the Libyan-Egyptian border. So now here's the first battle, and I'll try to explain what's going on here, although it will be easier for me to do that when it's my turn after these Access turns are done. But I'll still be able to explain a little bit. The first, so you can see in the upper left hand corner, this number four in the diamond is the morale uh, composite score of the access at this point, and the number three is the composite morale uh, score for the Commonwealth. This score, if I hover over it and click, you can see that. The number four up there is determined because the combat units, the units on the left hand side of the screen, the access units, have an average morale factor of one. And these morale numbers on the units are the ones in the blue diamonds. So this one has a two this one has a 1, this one has a 1. Also, they receive an armor bonus because they have armor units here, uh, first group of tanks. 
they reser re, uh, receive an armor superiority bonus. And I guess that's just because the Commonwealth on the other side has no armor. All they have are obstacles, which is barbed wire and mines, landmines. And then they have an Air Force bonus because they have these air groups. So those add up to four, and that's why it's a four. Now over here on the Commonwealth side, I guess it's a highly motivated string of barbed wire here because the morale of the barbed wire and the obstacles is three. Now every time there's a round in this battle, and I'll show you what the round looks like, that's when things start happening extremely quickly, the fatigue for both sides goes down one. <clears throat> and when you get to zero, that's when it becomes much more increased likely that that side will panic or even worse, rout, and then the battle will be over. So you want to go into these battles with as high a morale factor in the upper left hand or right hand corner as possible. I will be, so it's asking me here, this is the battle for Saloom. I'm not very good at pronouncing these words. And it asks me if I want to play a card, uh, Sandstorm or Shore Bombardment. This battle takes place on the coast of the border between Libya and Egypt, so there could be naval ships that could participate. But if you see down here in the lower right-hand corner, I only have a 6% chance of winning, so I'll save these cards for another opportunity because I'm at best going to damage these troops because they'll, the, the landmines will blow them up or something, although I don't think I can even do that. And I'll explain that later on when we actually get to the battle. So I'm just going to click up here. I'm not using any defender cards. It may ask me again if I want to do defender cards. I don't want to do any defender cards. So now battles take place in basically three steps. First, artillery fires trying to soften up the units that it's attacking. Then there'll be uh, attacks from the Air Force also trying to soften up the defenders and finally the actual land units will attack. And one of the frustrating things for a lot of people in playing this game is how the battles work and how the numbers work and how the mechanics work. So you can see for example on this artillery unit it has a one that is white and then a one to the right of it that is grayed out. And if I hover over it, you can see, I'll go up here, uh, it'll show that the combat factor for this 10th artillery unit is a 1 and a 1. The first one being for attacking, the second one for defending. The artillery is attacking, so only the left-hand side, the 1, is illuminated. Now over here on uh, my side, the Commonwealth side, only the right-hand number is white, not grayed out, and that's a two, and I'll explain that when it comes time uh, for the defenders to play in this battle. Down here it says fire, so that would start the round for the artillery, and what's going to happen, and th this is kind of frustrating for a lot of people that first start the game. Once you become clear on this, then it's not such a big deal, although I think it still goes too fast. When I click fire, there is an invisible 20-sided dice that will roll, and you'll get a number between 0 and 19. And in order for this unit to be successful in damaging the defending units, there really aren't any units over there, just landmines and obstacles, but that will change a little bit in this first round as I explain. I would have to get, or the dice would have to be either a zero or a one. It has to be less than or matching this attack number. And if that happens, then on these defender units, they have these little squares, white square. The mines have two squares, the obstacles have one square, and one of those squares will get eliminated so it means that that unit has been degraded. 
the computer chooses which unit loses the square. I think there's a logic to it somewhere. It's explained somewhere. But I'm not clear on that. That's still a thing that I have to learn. I wish that was a little clearer. Once a unit gets less than half of its squares eliminated, it becomes at risk to panic or to rout. So if this obstacle gets hit, it's only got one square. It will, in fact, that will destroy it. It'll, it'll be gone. So you don't want your defenders to lose all of their, uh, I guess you call them life force or uh, strength points. If the mines lose one, that'll put them down to half, and then again they'll be at risk to losing, uh, to, to fleeing or panicking or routing. So let me show you how this battle works, and then this will be how it works throughout the whole game. So if you can understand this, you, you'll understand 75% of the game, but this unfortunately is the one thing that is never explained in any of the videos on the Avalon Hill channel about this game. So, when I click fire, you're going to have to watch over here really quickly because this invisible 20-sided die will put a number right beside it. In fact, for some reason, <laughs> this unit gets to fire twice. And I'm not clear on that either. I did ask about it and they said, well, it's heavy artillery, although <laughs> it doesn't say heavy artillery. Now, the rule about how many times each unit can fire when they attack is based on these two little dots here, that means they get to fire twice, so the die gets to roll twice, so they get two opportunities to do damage. Uh, and sometimes they only have one dot, like right here, and that means they only get one chance to roll the dice. For some reason, these artillery get to fire twice, so now you're going to see what happens. You've got to watch really quickly, be because the, the, the die roll results happen very, very fast. One thing, fortunately, if it is a successful die roll, which would be a 1 or a 0, that will be in yellow. If it's not, the number will be in black. Now, when this is all over, there will be a record of everything that happened, so you can still see in a relatively uh, easy way what happened. So I'm going to press fire. It's going to happen really, really quick. Don't blink. 14, 2. Neither one of them did damage because 14 and 2 are both above 1. It almost did damage. Now here's where you can see in the middle this 10th artillery, the first number like I say was a 14, nothing happened, it says miss. The second one was a 2, nothing happened and they missed. Now it's the turn for the Air Force. Now if there was artillery over on the Commonwealth side or Air Force on the Commonwealth side, they would now be getting their turn, but they don't. Now each of these air units, you can tell on the unit there's a B, that means they are bombers only. And if I did have fighter planes over here, these bomber units would be at a lot of risk because they don't have any fighter escorts, uh, which would help them. So I'm going, so now they each have a 2 attack rating. So that's better than the one. It's still, you know, not great. And I'm going to press down here bombard. So they're going to bombard the barbed wire and bombard these mines. And they each have two opportunities because of these two little white dots to inflict damage. So there'll be eight complete uh, die rolls. And as a result, probably there will be damage. But th again, don't blink. Watch really carefully over here. The yellow numbers mean a hit, the black numbers mean not. I'm going to press bombard. 2, a hit. 5, 17, 17, 11, 9, 16. And so there was one hit, and <coughs> that the computer determined <coughs> that the mines would lose one of their two points, and then there's some secret process that happens that I don't understand, and the mines are eliminated from this battle. Now, it's a little weird uh, because down here you can see there's a white flag and there's a, <coughs> a skull. If the mines had lost all of their white squares, then I guess they're dead. That's a little more understandable with units. <coughs> and they would be stored over here with this 
skull, which represents death, but now they're only panicked, I guess, although I don't see how minds can panic. Okay, now we are going to continue with this fight, and it's unfortunate that the mines are not in play because they did have a number two down here to defend, so they would have had a chance at least to, to do some damage to these units, like a, you know, the soldiers or the uh, tank units would have hit the mines, but this obstacle uh, doesn't have, you can't do anything with it, it's a zero, zero. So maybe I guess if I roll a zero, somebody got killed on the <laughs> barbed wire. But anyway, we're going to uh, start this battle, and these are where the really big battles happen. You can see that the armor units have a three attack factor, and these two soldier units have a two attack factor. This is, I guess, motorized infantry, and they have a three attack factor. Now, I might as well tell you here, since we're stopped, there is one additional, there are two additional numbers on these units, and they're common with all the units. Over here is a number, and you can see it's in the white square, it's a number one. <laughs> they're all number ones, except right here, they're, they're number twos. Each of the regions that you'll see on the map in a little bit can contain only so many units. They're called stacks, stacking limits. And these white numbers in the white squares determine uh, how many uh, stacks, uh, how many units make up the stack in a particular region. So if, if you had these five units in a stack, in a, in a region, their stack total would be one, two, three, four, five, six. They, there would be six units in the stack, and most of the regions can hold 14. The other number on all units is the movement factor, and that's in the black circle over to the right. So when you're on the map, and we're not, we haven't been on the map because it's not our turn really, but the artillery could move seven, uh, they have seven points. It depends on what kind of terrain they're going through because each region has a movement cost. And if you're on a road in a clear area, the movement cost is just one. So you could theoretically go through seven regions with this, with these tanks. Now the art, uh, the infantry is slower. They can only go five spaces, and the aircraft, of course, uh, can go a lot farther. They can go 18. But let's have the big fight here, and the obstacles, obstacle will get destroyed, I'm sure, very quickly. But each of these units only has one dot, so they're only going to get one shot each. So the, the Air Force here had eight shots, and these will have five, only six shots, so they actually have less shots. So let's fight. Now look for the yellow numbers. There's a hit, and that's going to blow up the obstacle. There's another hit, and it says victory access, and you can, but it's all gone now. That's unfortunate that it goes so fast like that. Now we're on to the next battle. This is the battle for Fort Madalena, which is a little bit more to the south of the coast. <coughs> And this particular, they're fighting an obstacle, so they're just fighting barbed wire. So again, this is a little silly to be explaining a lot of this in, in the uh, first turn of the access. But they have a, a higher morale value, and that's because they have a leader. And this is really their main force. Their leader here is Graziani. And you can see that he boosts allied units <coughs> by one attack factor and one morale. So all of these units will have an increased battle factor. I don't really see it here, but I know they have an increased morale factor because their morale average is two, and then with the leader that goes up to three. Then they have armor. They have these armor units, so that gives them another morale factor, they have air force and air superiority, and that adds up to six. Now I only have a two percent chance of winning again here, so I'm not going to use any defender cards. And once again, the uh, 
the artillery units will fire, they each get two shots, but only a one or a zero will create damage on the obstacle here, but they each get two shots, so here they go, no hit, no hit, no hit, no hit, and you can see it's all listed here. Now the air units will fire, and they each have two hits. Now we do have, in this group, a fighter bomber, so it says here that they only have a land combat factor. Now I'm not sure if that's just because there are no air units on the other side or it's just really bad fighters that they don't do any good against air unit opponents. But anyway, I'll bombard. There's a hit. There's another hit. And it's all over. They win. Now again, it's gone. Here's another battle. Now they're kind of taking the Commonwealth by surprise. <coughs> I think I'll use my Sandstorm here because I now have a recon unit that I kind of want to help retreat because it's not going to win. I think that this battle that we just saw, there is a feature in the game where if you win a battle and you have air units and armor un mobile units, armor units, you can break out and go to the next region and continue fighting. And I think that's what this did, the, uh, the access did, because again, here's this leader and uh, the artillery is mobile. And uh, I'm not quite, I guess the army, uh, I don't know if these soldiers are mobile or not, but anyway, they're, they're fighting. But I only have an 11% chance to win, so I've used the Sandstorm card. I, I didn't really show you what you know, the Sandstorm, uh, the cards that have been played go up here so, uh, to the upper left-hand corner. The Axis has played an Aerial Reconnaissance, Re Reconnaissance card, and that means it gets to look at one hidden enemy stack anywhere on the map. And over here, I just played the Sandstorm card, so it, in, in, this, in the game, a Sandstorm prevents a long battle and low visibility hampers fighting for all units on both sides and they suffer a minus one combat penalty. So I think you can see over here, uh, I don't know about the artillery, there's still one, so I'm not quite sure who's, maybe it's the these uh, items here, these units here suffer the penalty. But the main thing is, I don't think the planes will be able to attack in a sandstorm, but it's gonna help me get let this recon unit, it's an Australian, motorized recon unit and I want it to retreat as soon as possible. So here they're going to fire, no damage, no damage, no damage. Now the air units are going to be able to attack and their, you can see their attack numbers are in red, their combat factors, and I think that's because the sandstorm is making it difficult for them, which is good. So, so in this case only a zero on the 20-sided die, zero through 19, can inflict damage, and this one, a one can. So now they're going to bombard. No damage, no damage. Now I get a chance, because the mines are still out here, I get a chance to see if, if I can inflict some damage on them by some unit running over the mines. It's not a lot of possibility, because they only have a one uh, defend factor, so I get to roll dice now for my defenders, but only a zero or one will inflict some damage. So this will happen quickly, no damage. But this creates an opportunity for me to retreat and get this thing to safety, this recon unit. So I'm going to retreat and the battle is over. We have another battle and this is a battle against another recon unit that I have, which is an Indian Army recon unit. And it's asking me if I want to use shore bombardment. I don't really want to do that. <coughs> I only have a 10% chance of winning. I'm going to try to get out of here really fast. So not playing any defender cards. It's going to ask me again. No. Now the artillery is getting ready to fire. They'll get two shots, I'm sure. I don't know why they get two shots. 
but it has to be a zero or a one to do any damage. So fire, no damage, no damage, and now I get to retreat, so I get out of here because I had no opportunity, no, no chance to win. And finally, <laughs> there's, I guess that my, when, when I retreated from, a, from the battle, two battles ago, well, maybe this is a completely different uh, recon unit, I, I, I can't quite remember, but it's a smaller force that's attacking me. They do still have a lot of good morale. They have an armor bonus and they have armor superiority. So they have a three level morale over here. I have a one level morale. I guess uh, this recon unit had been in a previous battle because every time you go through a battle, you lose uh, and a round of a battle, not just the whole battle, you lose a combat, you lose a fatigue factor. You, you lose a, a morale factor because of fatigue. So right off the bat, I get an opportunity to retreat, and I'm going to retreat because I only had a 31% chance of winning. So th now this is going to disappear, unfortunately. When, when it's after my turn, I'll get to look at it a lot longer. Now because of these battles that I retreated from, they have an opportunity to siege uh, structures, forts, and, and things like that, air bases, airfields. But again, this is going by so ridiculously fast that uh, you just see, you can see afterwards that they, that they won, but even that's gone now. So unfortunately, that's too bad. It goes too fast. So now, here's the summary. Again, all this stuff goes by so fast, but it's really not that important. It's more important when it's your turn. So you can see that in, in the first half of the turn, which is September 1940, I believe each turn consists of two weeks. There are eight turns totally in this scenario. You, you can see uh, <laughs> that we're in the first turn. The, uh, the Axis picked up one victory point because they must have taken a location, a region that was for the victory point, and I'll explain that in a second. There's some other things here. This is a little confusing. It's like defeats. Uh, it's my units routed. They retreated. So they had three sieges, an airfield, a fort, and another airfield. They were able to take over those three areas that they sieged, and then <laughs> I played one card, and I guess it shows you what the access plate they had reconnaissance. So now we're starting our turn and you get to see a lot more information. You get to see that um, the battle's starting and we're defending the Libyan Egyptian border and we have a new, this is all historical, we have a new uh, <coughs> commander O'Connor. There'll be a commander in chief that uh, takes over one thing you can see now finally up here, I believe, maybe not quite yet, but you can also see for the first time what's going on with the scenario rules and everything. So I guess it's a little unfortunate that if you're not the first one to start the game, you don't get to see that. Maybe I could have at the very beginning of the game, but it didn't seem like I could. So now, now I can see up here what the scenario information is. And <laughs> this is actually very well done, very nice. It gives you an introduction to what, what historically happened. It talks about the duration. Yeah, each turn is two weeks starting in September. It shows you what forces you have. The Commonwealth has British Indian RAF units. Italian has Italian uh, and other kind of Italian armies. It shows you the map board. And it shows you what you need <coughs> to win victory points. You can do an immediate victory if you suddenly overwhelm <coughs> the other side, but that's not really going to happen very easily. And then it shows you victory points. Uh, one player, uh, and I think the Italian player must, like for instance, they must have taken uh, something I controlled. Again, I'm not quite clear on why they got that one victory point. It shows when reinforcements are going to occur. I'll be getting reinforcements. I don't think they'll get any reinforcements talks about some special things that are unique to this particular scenario because all the other SGS games basically use the same system so the nice thing is once you finally understand the mechanics you will be able to apply that to all the other SGS games but uh, for each 
scenario, there are particular rules and idiosyncra idiosyncratic things which are interesting, and you can read them here, but really I'm not trying to go over that for the purposes of this game. Now here is the border, and you can see that basically the light-colored areas are the areas that the Commonwealth has. The Commonwealth actually has these areas too, but apparently because of fog of war, I don't know what's going on in those units, in those regions. But I can expand the map now. This is really kind of the Libya, uh, e Egyptian border, Libya to the left, Egypt to the right. And down here, there are, I can click on this, and this shows me what's called the inspector. So all these little things here, these little spaces that light up when I put the cursor over it are regions. And if I right click, it shows me the name of the region. It shows me the movement cost. This particular region, it requires two movement points. I showed you on those units, they have their little movement cost factors. Uh, if there's no modifier that helps you in attacking or defending. It has a little, like a little picture of what the terrain looks like. It, it looks like North Africa, the Sahara Desert. You can pursue units in a battle. You can you can break through and go to the next region. Supply can go through. The supply becomes very important in this game because the desert area doesn't have many outposts that allow you to have supplies. So you have to be careful if you're winning and you're breaking through and you're moving on quickly you may end up with the enemy circling back and cutting off your supply line. The, the main supplies for the Italians come on the left side of the screen from Tripoli and the main supplies for the Commonwealth come from the right side of the screen from Alexandria, Egypt. Now if I click on the second one there are regions and I could type in the name of a region to find it or I can just click on any name and it'll center the screen on that particular region. Then there are structures. These are the things that <laughs> you can siege and you can see these little stars. I think that if you uh, capture an area that has a star and it, it's an, uh, an opponent's area, then you win a victory point. And finally, there are, these are all the units that are on the board and you can only see your own units but if you click on any of these it will take you to that unit so that is convenient although frankly I don't really use that all that much in the game Th this uh, little button here will center the view and kind of zoom you out so if you get lost on the map you can use that the two flags will show you what you control and what the enemy controls and now you can see all the blue is what I control the green is what the access controls the barrel is your supply readings and anything that just has a flag your sides flag you have supply that you can achieve but some of these regions apparently like right here is really desolate or rough area if it, I don't really know what's the di what the difference is between like right here I clicked on this and this has supply it, it just is kind of flat if I click over here where their barrel is uh, indicating there's no supply then it it looks I don't know it looks a little rougher I don't really know why that'd be the case but it, uh, apparently it's historically accurate so here it says it's starting my turn I'm losing five to six if I click under the car draw that's the phase we're in it'll show all the phases for the turn car draw air base return we'll go through all of these and then this tutorial will be over but it says car draw so I go down here I click on this and it gives me the opportunity to play uh, Wavell, who is the new commander-in-chief that boosts expectations, it gives me one extra victory point and I can draw two extra cards. So I put that over here. Now, I can only, I get to draw two cards, but it'll show me two cards. I only get to draw one. Then it'll show me two more and I get to draw one. I think that I'll choose the strong point 
I'm not really going to explain. So I click on that, it goes it goes down into my lower left hand corner. Now I have two more. I'm going to pick thick armor and that goes down. Uh, I'll explain that in another tutorial video. Because so I'm just really trying to go through battle mechanics. Now all the cards have... If you can draw a card down here, as you saw previously with my Defender cards, they kind of glow green. And uh, none of them are glowing green. And I, I can look look at these cards here and see what I have going on. But I'm all done drawing cards, so I go up to the upper right-hand corner and I click this button. Now we've moved on to reinforcements, so I go down to the lower left-hand corner and you can see I've got glowing green cards. And I think I'll be able to pick all of these. The depots uh, will be able to allow me to put supplies in with a unit or a region. I'm not, I can't quite remember if it's the unit or the region and then they're going to be in supply and they can take that with them. The logistics creates a supply relay point. It can't move with units, but if I can uh, use that at some point, and I think, I, I, I don't know whether it automatically, I, it automatically goes into effect or I have to put it into effect, but that creates opportunities for me to extend my supply line along the coast. Here is a strong point card, and it says that the entrenchment level of the selected of the selected stack is increased by one level <laughs> and finally I guess that's all so oh okay so now here's my strong point I get to decide where I want to put the strong point and uh, I'm, uh, I'll turn off both the supply and the uh, territory uh, overlays, but I think I'll put the strong point here so it looks like uh, it says I have to uh, select a stack. So the strong point goes with the stack, it goes with this fifth brigade, and then I click here to kind of confirm that this stack now could entrench and become very difficult to attack. Okay, so now I go down here, I still have one more reinforcement card, I can put a new minefield in, I click that, and that goes over to the cards I have. Now this depot card that I got earlier, see it, uh, I, I get to pick a depot up here, it doesn't really matter which one, and I think I get to put this in a region, so I click this, <laughs> so I've selected the depot, now I click up here this flashing arrow and I get to pick a region to put the depot in. So I think I'll put the depot in this region that I just put the strong point in. That wants me to validate it to make sure that that's what I want to do. Now I have another strong point uh, somewhere. Well, anyway, oh, it's a fort. I can I can uh, create a fort, and the forts just kind of slow down. I mean, as far as I can understand in the game, the forts slow down the advancement of the enemy. So I'm going to pick this fort, and you can see things about the fort. It's a bunker type. It never retreats, which is one thing, so it can it can be kind of irritating for an advancing enemy because they can't, it, it can't flee or panic or anything like that. They have to completely destroy it to move on. So now I get to choose a stack to put this fort with, and I think I'll just pick this the same place here. And then I'll, I'll val that I did before with the strong point. Now I have a minefield, so uh, I get to put, uh, deploy a minefield, and the minefield gets to be put with a stack. And I think I'll put that down here to create some problems for the enemy advancing. And now I have mines, so I get to select the mine stack, and I get to select. A stack to put the mines with, and uh, I'll put the mines down here. And now this is a summary. These things never are not really that helpful. It just you know shows me what I did. But I guess you could if I if I had a short term memory loss, I could click on this and see what I did with all these things. Okay, now air movement. This uh, allows me to move my air units to attack the enemy, even though I can't really see where the enemy is, but I can still move them to regions where I'm pretty sure the enemy is. 
A couple of things unique to this particular scenario, as I understand it anyway, here is the uh, Royal Air Force 6 Squadron and the, the Italians are going to come rampaging through this particular part of the map. So I don't want to leave it here because they will uh, take over this air base down here and then I'll lose all these fighters. So I'm, for the movement for these fighters, I'm going to relocate them over here to this air base. And when it glows in a, in a green circle like that, it means that I have that's become its new air base because this air base is going to get captured, I'm sure, pretty soon. Now, I told you about the stack limits. If I click on this button here, it shows me what the stack limits are for every region on the map. And for most of them, it'll show you zero, meaning there are no air units there and a maximum stack limit is four. So I could put four air units. Most of these air units have mul uh, groups have multiple units. So this one has two and it has a stack uh, amount of one for each unit. So the total is two. So I could move this to a somewhere over here and that would take up two of the stacking uh, points. I would still have two left over so I'm going to move. This consists of a fighter and a bomber group and I'm going to position them over here in the enemy territory. This is actually the territory that they just took from us. And sometimes the there'll be dogfights between the fighter planes and again it's a little unfortunate that that happened so quickly but what it said was as I quickly read it is that there was a dogfight between the Italian Air Force and the British and the Italians took hits and they ran. It, unfortunately that it, that happened so quickly for someone trying to learn the game it's like what was that? Okay now I have another air unit here and they also, they're bombers, they also have two stacking total points, so I can move them here with what I with the air units I just moved. And now you can see it says 4-4. Four, four. Now one thing that you can do to find air units you haven't moved, you can go down to this little uh, circle and it'll show you the next stack. And I've got air units over here in Alexandria, and I just, with them, I just want to base them closer to where the action is going to be so that they don't have to keep going back to Alexandria to refuel and get uh, ammunition. So there you can see that it glows a green circle and that will be their new air base. Now I'm going to click, now this is still flashing so it means I have air units that I haven't moved yet. And so I have air units way down here and I'm going to move them up here they have uh, bomber units that total two stack points so I'll move them and relocate them to this base. So now <clears throat> this will probably go black, yeah, so I'm done with air movement. <clears throat> this black, I have no more to move so I go up to this arrow and this shows that dog fighting I was talking about. It showed, now it fortunately because it's my turn this is not going to go away instantly but it shows that over Solemn, the uh, Axis, the Italian Air Force, took hits and they they routed. That means they're way gone. Now, I'm not quite sure what, what these gold things here mean. I don't know if that means they're superior elite flyers or what. I don't really know what it means. I, uh, but we're going to go to the next phase, land movement. Now, the first thing in land movement, you get to see if you can play some of these cards. So I have a reconnaissance card. I don't really understand <coughs> what this does. It says radio finding help searches. Radio finding help search. Some of the grammar is a little not, it would not get an A plus in an English class. Your search tests receive a minus three bonus this turn. So I put it up there and I guess, so the reconnaissance up here is done. So I'm done with the reconnaissance. Now I still have another land movement card, fast movement card. I'll be able to play this if I want to, uh, but I'm going to save it over here for when I want to. So now, I guess I, uh, I guess I have to play it now, unfortunately. 
I shouldn't, maybe I shouldn't have done that, I don't know. Uh, here's a unit over here that has arrived in Alexandria, so I'll, I'll give that to him so that he can hurry up to the middle of the map here where the battle is going to be taking place. So, okay, he's got that. So now the, the cards are all done, so now we actually get to move land units because we're in the land movement phase. And I, first of all, I'm going to move these recon units out of the way. And you can see it has a, a big white nine. That means they can go through nine. They have nine movement factors. And like, for instance, this next territory, it has a movement cost of one. Now this territory, where you can't get supply, it has a movement cost of two. So there is some kind of rugged uh, terrain, but it's not going to bother the movement because I'm just moving <coughs> this recon unit up here kind of out of harm's way at least for a while because they're going to be approaching over here maybe I'll move him over here where this fort is now I also want to move this uh, unit over here too they'll have greater protection where the fort is and I want to get this guy out of here too because he's really in trouble and I'll see how so it's kind of can, you, you can drag it where you want it to go or you can click on it and then right click and it'll show you places where you can go and you can just right click and it'll go there and um, so if I drag it it'll show you green you can go there now, if I moved it here, it would mean that it would go into a battle. I don't want to go into battle. I could drag it here. <coughs> it shows me I have nine points available. It, it costs two. I could, now I have, this costs three. I have nine points available. Uh, and I can keep going, uh, actually, all the way up here. So I think I'll just go up here. Now, I want to, I'm t basically, I'm trying to get units that are, don't have a lot of strength uh, and might be threatened. I want to get them out of the way. Now, I click on this button down here in the lower right hand corner. Now, this shows me my stack limits. So, so far in in this territory, for some reason, I don't have, it says I don't have any any units stacked. Now, I don't really understand because I guess they all have they all have zero stack factors. I guess they're really small. So, I'm going to move this depot up here too and get that out of the way. Now I can start thinking about moving. I would like to protect this air base here, Sid Barani, and this kind of marks the the, the borderline between the Axis and the Allies. And I don't really want to lose anything beyond this. I want to start moving towards becoming offensive. So. I've got, let's see what I have, uh, here I have an armored unit down here, but unfortunately you see it, this sometimes happens at the beginning of scenarios, you can't move the units in the first turn because they're not prepared, I guess, but this has a zero, so you can see if I, if I, if I tried to move this, it doesn't let me do anything because it has a zero. Now next turn, I'll be able to move it quite a bit. And the same is true. This is O'Connor. This is my main force. But I can't move this either until next turn. I do want to move these people up because I'd like to get them over to way over here. And I don't know if I can do that, but I'll try. So if I right, if I click on that and then right click, this has no movement. None of these have any movement. These have movement. So uh, let me try this. So this, I'll move him this far. And then I'll move. This is the Australian 19th Brigade. And I'm going to move it this far. And I can get it here. And I guess I better move these over there too because. Right now, you can see it has a four stack un stack points out of 14, and this has four. Look down here; it says four stack values. So, I'll, I can move these over here, 
and now it's up to eight. Now that really, these can't move. The depot, I'll move that over here. I maybe should have put some of these recon units over here. I'll see. This recon unit could go over there just to give them a little more, uh, you know, just something more than nothing. And I'll move that recon unit over there. So they're all, so now we have eight. Now I'm going to look down here. It looks like this is black, so they're all, they've, all my movement uh, units have moved. So now we're going to start, if you look here, the next thing, we'll have the battles. So we're getting near the end of this video, but I click up here and now we go to the battle phase. So we only really have one battle and that's where I put all those units. So let's see what we're up against. Uh, if you click on this, it'll take you to the map where the battle is taking place. So there's where the battle is taking place. And if I click up here, then, it, then if I click on this arrow, that'll start the battle. So, not so good. Well, it, <laughs> it's not so bad. It, I guess this is, these are the bombers that I sent in. I guess nobody's attacking that, that region where I moved those troops, so that's, that's good. So these are the bombers that I had moved in, and they have an advantage, 68% to 32%, so I really do have an advantage, and they all can fire twice. <laughs> now the thing is, <laughs> with air units, after they have fired their two times, then, it, uh, it, then they're done. They don't have anything else that they can attack with, so they leave, and it'll show here on the screen, it'll say, oh, the uh, Commonwealth lost, and they fled. Actually, they, so that, that's a little uh, confusing. They didn't really lose, they just, you know, flew by and dropped their bombs, and they took off. So now they're going to bombard, so again, we're going to go, they, each, they have the two little white dots, they'll each, all of these will get uh, two rounds. Now, this is the fighter round, so it really doesn't have any thing that it's going to do to the ground forces, I don't think. But it, I think it did help hit some of those Axis fighters that tried to intercept us and they got run off. The bombers have two uh, attack factor points, so any, a zero, one, or two when we roll the invisible 20-sided dice will create a hit over here. And you can see these Italian troops have two, four, six, eight of these hit points or squares, so they can take a lot of damage, but if they get down to four hits, they're going to flee, and uh, they'll, they'll go down here where this white flag is most likely. But let's start the bombing, so it's going to happen fast. Look for the yellow numbers. No hit, no hit, no hit, one hit, no hit, one hit. Okay, so I didn't talk about morale, uh, you know, so <laughs> they all took off. They didn't want to, so that, unfortunately, that's, that, uh, they took off. The fighter unit did not fire, as I had predicted, and the Italian morale is really weak in this game, so if they take any hits and don't have a commander with them, that commander, the Graziani, they're going to take off really fast. So you can see they took two hits. That was enough to make them panic. They took off. It's too bad that it just goes like that so fast that you can't really see where they went or anything like that. But it used to be when the game first came out that nothing nothing paused. And uh, that really made it... I, I didn't play the game for several months because it was just too confusing. Okay, now we're at the end of the turn, kind of. Uh, we're at the defensive air air defense move, and that just means all of the air units that you have, you can place them near the enemy lines, but not in the enemy area. So you're just trying to anticipate where you will be attacked, and you're trying to put air uh, power up there to deter that attack. And that could be attacked by planes, it could be attacked by land forces, so the bombers are relevant to this too. And I'll put up, I'll, I'll now go back to the air uh, stack limitations. I've got these fighter planes here, and I'm sure, so I, I can't, 
put the fighter planes anywhere where it's green and they have a stack value of one but I would like to have these fighters I think let's see what I have over here I have I have fighters and bombers over here I have fighters and bombers over here I think I'll because these have a four limit uh, a four stack value I think I'll put those over here because that will use up my four and I am probably going to be I'm going to put the fighters over here because although the, these fighters don't have much uh, movement fact movement points so they can't go I, I don't really understand this it's like they have eight movement points but if I move them there then they can't move any now for some reason they can move here so I'll I'll move them here and I think I'll move them here because I think they're going to want to try to take over this air base and that maybe will do some good now down here you can see go to next stack that hasn't moved yet I think I just have this one stack and I think I will move them if they can't they can't get that far apparently for some reason again uh, if I right left click on this and then right click supposedly it'll show me where I can go but it, it, this doesn't really work all that great uh, sometimes for the air movement okay so I'm gonna have to drag this wherever it's green and I guess I'll move there that's a little frustrating because it gives you all these weird arrows and uh, it's not exactly clear why you can suddenly get over the screen space but you can't get to any of these places nearby so now this is black I can't move the air any more air units so we'll go to the final phase which is basically the turn end and you can see now up here I have been able to win a victory point and that was basically just because I brought in O'Connor it's not because I won a battle but we're even in victory points and I'm going to conclude the uh, video right now and I'll make the next one with the next turn